that I truly pointed out that these are the ways that cells communicate. So I kind of wanted to go back at that question and just kind of remind you. So we know that, this, that the cells have many ways to communicate, but in asking principal ways that they communicate, all right, first thing, and it's definitely important um, in this chapter because of the fact that hormones travel in the bloodstream and they have to be able to move out at that capillary bed at their target tissue and target organs. So that was by way of the gap junctions. Okay, so that's one of the principal ways that cells are going to communicate. A second way that cells are going to communicate, <clears throat> those neurotransmitters. <clears throat> when we have that nerve cell stored at those terminal ends are the product and that product is a neurotransmitter. The third way that the cells communicate, that was that term paracrine, which is what we looked at earlier in the chapter. And I kind of referenced how this was a way that a cell, if, say, for example, it got infected with the virus, it kind of sent off signals to the other cells around it because that is a way for a cell to have the local control. Do you guys remember us talking about that? Okay. And then the fourth way is, of course, hormones. So those are the four principal ways that cells are going to communicate. So as I looked, um, we have answered what is endocrinology, list the endocrine glands, define exocrine, endocrine, what is a fenestrative capillary, can some organs be both endocrine exocrine, which has the faster speed of transmission, how do chemicals travel in the body? Now. This we kind of touched on. Can a chemical serve as both a hormone and a neurotransmitter? We touched on this a little bit on Tuesday. Do you happen to remember if a chemical can serve as both a hormone and a neurotransmitter? Yes. The example, noradrenaline from the adrenal gland. How do the chemicals travel? We talked about that. Um, to do, to do, to do. Define a neuroendocrine cell. What makes a cell a target? What two organs have the most influence? Now, let's just go back to that one for a second. What two organs have the most influence? Can you tell me which two? Hypothalamus. Our hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So those are the two that have the most control. Then, of course, we've talked about where the hypothalamus is located, where the pituitary gland is located. We talked about the infundibulum. I gave you the names for anterior and posterior pituitary. Um, we talked about the hypophyseal portal. Um, do, 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 and I think, um, and we talked about the hypothalamohypophyseal tract, and then we were sort of leaving off at this point 
on Tuesday, where how does the hypothalamus have the control? So that was pretty much the point we left off. So that's where we're going to pick up for today. Um, let me get back to... Because this was the point that we had left off. And we were identifying these differences between the anterior and the posterior pituitary. And just to go back and refresh our memory just a little bit, the anterior pituitary, cellular, Posterior pituitary neuroendocrine. Does everyone remember those terms? Okay. We have the communication for the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary by way of that portal system. The hypothalamus to the posterior is by way of the tract, T-R-A-C-T, because it's the axons that are doing that. So we learn, and the other part that I think I mentioned on Tuesday, products that are made in the anterior pituitary are immediately used. The products of the posterior pituitary can be stored and they're stored in the posterior pituitary. We then looked at hormones that are found because one of the things that we mentioned is we're going to find that there are hormones of the hypothalamus. Now, in noting these hormones of the hypothalamus, be sure to note those terms that are present because we've got releasing, 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 inhibiting, releasing. That is because that hypothalamus is trying to tell the pituitary to do something. So the information from that hypothalamus is going to that pituitary gland. That anterior portion, which is cellular, when it receives the releasing command, for example, from the hypothalamus, when it receives that releasing command, there are the cells in that anterior pituitary that can hopefully make what's being requested. So that anterior pituitary, for example, stimulating. If the anterior is going to do a stimulating chemical release, this means it needs to go to a target organ, all right? Because if it is to stimulate, it is to go to that target organ and get that target organ to do something. Does that make sense? All right. We have some that are just straight up the hormone that will go to that target tissue. Stimulating, hormone, hormone, hormone. All right, so their names are important for letting us know what they need to do. Pretty much the information from the hypothalamus either make it or don't. The releasing or the inhibiting. 
So if we look at the hormones all together, okay, in the hypothalamus, you've got to love this area of the brain, okay? Got to give it its kudos, all right? And what's funny, um, it's, it's like, I guess because of what I teach, okay, people are always asking me medical questions, okay? Like my good friend this morning, we're talking, and she's like, did I tell you about, you know, she's like talking about her daughter, and she's like, um, you know, and she wanted me to ask you. <laughs> I'm just like, well, I really don't know, but I'll tell you what I might think it is, and then you really need to like go to the doctor and have it checked, and it just so happened to be something about thyroid hormone, and so I'm just sitting here, and I'm just like, oh, man, I gotta just, you know, maybe I just shouldn't tell people what I do, you know, what I teach or anything, because I don't always know, but what I do is I try to take the information that I get and incorporate it um, in a step fashion that I can understand. And that's how I'm going to try to teach this to y'all, okay? Because these hormones, the ways that they're going to act, okay, once again, we're going to look at them working on a feedback system, all right? And one of the things, I can't remember if we've talked about it in this class or not, but the feedback system that will help the body maintain homeostasis is a negative feedback system. Okay, did y'all learn that in part one or did we talk about that yet? Because we have the two systems, we've got a negative feedback and we've got a positive feedback. And for maintaining control over these hormones, we're going to be very dependent on negative feedback because that helps maintain homeostasis. There will be a chemical that works as a hormone by way of positive feedback but for the most part, positive is not beneficial to the body, okay? So if we look at these hormones, once again, I'm trying to point out that we have the hormones that are going to be released from that area of the brain of the hypothalamus, okay? If you remember where the hypothalamus is located, okay, if you remember where that's located, um, one of the things that I tried to point out, it's the primitive area of the brain. It's close to the brain stem, all right, and it's, it's an area that not only will have control centers, but it also is close to areas where you find control centers. So that hypothalamus, there is a total of eight altogether. <laughs> now, if we look at that pituitary gland, once again, by way of that infundibulum, get the posterior portion, and the anterior portion, okay? Anterior is usually, is all, usually, I'm not going to say always because things can be different, okay? But the anterior is usually the bigger portion. So, six of these eight, now, they're going to go, let me do another line right down through here since that's how we kind of looked at it. They're going to go to 
this anterior pituitary. Those six are going to go.